Hi, welcome to Tech Talk. I'm Alan Russell with FCTV, and I'm joined by Joe, a local uh, scientist here from Woods Hole that is also an uh, AI enthusiast and expert uh, in your professional and personal life, right? Yeah. It's an uh, it's exciting mm. time for, um, for, uh, for AI. Mm. Yeah, so how did you get started uh, in the AI space? Well, it's a long story, <laughs> which I'll t try to shorten <laughs> for the occasion. Mm. Um, it started a long time ago, really, mm. when um, my father, who was a biologist who used computers extensively in the 70s, um, got interested in AI because he was doing research in self-organizing biological systems and knew oh. people who had theories of psychology and theories of evolution that included intelligence as an emergent property of biological systems. Mm. And he got interested in another aspect of AI, which was is understanding science with AI. Mm. So building tools that would, would be able to read scientific papers, for example, and interpret them, and maybe come up with hypotheses and things like that. He spent the rest of his career trying to build that. Mm -hmm. And so that was throughout the 80s and 90s and things like that. Those and um, it was a more primitive time in AI. So if he was still alive today, he would be really astonished by what has happened just in the last few years, because we're starting to approach being able to do things like that um, in a way that is dr is a dramatic change from what it was like during his lifetime. So my mm -hmm. interest in AI started when I was a kid. Um, I got into scientific computing professionally um, after college, and I was always interested in automating things with computers, right? So I also am a musician, and mm -hmm. I've done a lot of, of programming in my musical work. Mm -hmm. So um, that drew me to these new AI tools recently. And then at work, it's just it's creating a revolution in science and in lots of other fields right now because it's yeah. the new techniques are just so powerful. Absolutely, I've uh, been following um, some of the astronomy data with uh, JWST and how they're using AI to um, try, try and you know, comb through some of that uh, data and help to make new discoveries and stuff. And I'm assuming they must be doing very similar things with you know, ocean mapping and with, all sorts of other science, with right? Ocean mapping, remote sensing of any planetary mm. science, you know, the list goes on and on. Mm. Medicine, um, they're, they're getting great results um, mm. in things like protein folding and, mm. and other kinds of uh, complex biological uh, data processing. Um, so genetics and things like that. There, there are tools that can be used for that that were not even developed for that. And that's one of the things that's happening with AI now is you, is you spin up one of these AIs and you discover that it can do things that you didn't tell it to do, tell yeah. it how to do. Absolutely, and that's you know something new and exciting from it. Um, but it's really grown at like an exponential rate. It's uh, surpassing uh, Moore's law. They're saying even uh, about the you know speed with which it's I increasing. Absolutely, yeah, and that's because there's a couple of very powerful techniques that were developed, um, and the revolution really started in about 2015 mm -hmm. uh, with the development of, with the open sourcing of uh, this tool that Google had developed for building deep neural networks, and that's an artificial system that is sort of like the brain, mm -hmm. uh, sort of metaphorically like the brain. It has lots of different interconnections, the way that a brain does, between different components that can interact with each other in ways that are so complex that you wouldn't be able to map it out in a single piece of, of code mm -hmm. or dis distill it to a set of rules. It's mm -hmm. more complex than that. And that certainly led to some issues with, you know, the transparency, and a lot of people, you know, kind of refer to it like a black box sometimes, right? Yeah. But that's, uh, you know, there are ways to, uh, you know, work with the transparency on that in some ways, right? Well, it's actually very challenging mm. to figure out what's going on inside mm. these neural networks. Um, they're hard to observe. They're mm. easy to compute, but they're difficult to observe because of the complexity. There are billions right. and billions of parameters mm -hmm. in some of these models, billions and billions of numbers to comb through, and the connections between them are so dense right. that it's difficult to know what's going on internally in these systems as they process data. 
Yeah, absolutely. I remember hearing about ChatGPT, how you know we uh, interact and live in three dimensions, and yet it's been able to you know process uh, and make these connections in so many different dimensions and all these you know interconnected uh, web kind of between all the words and uh, how to make words <laughs> and uh, you know create these uh, complex uh, essays and stuff that it's doing. Right, now all it's doing is it's mm. predicting the next word. Mm -hmm. How likely are, what, like out of all the words that you could put next, which right. is the most likely one? Mm. Which is remarkable that it can do that. Um, it's, mm. it's basically autocomplete. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a really, really powerful autocomplete. Mm. Um, and th that's all they did with it, is they give it, uh, gave it a bunch of text and they mm. said predict the next, and they knocked out the final word and said predict that word. If it gets it mm. right, it, uh, they, they tune it so that it does that kind of thing more often. Mm -hmm. And now we have uh, ChatGPT5 uh, you know, about to come out uh, soon as well. Um, and we've already seen since ChatGPT3 and 4, you know, this massive um, you know, upsurge in people adopting it and using it. How do you think um, this is going to uh, impact our, our future and our relation with AI? these tools. Yeah, well, I mean, there's really a, uh, some changes that are coming that are going to be pretty powerful that mm -hmm. have to do with interpreting things other than language. Mm -hmm. So interpreting images, interpreting videos, interpreting other kinds of data streams, and being able to converse in language about them. So, um, for instance, ChatGPT can summarize a long document, right. right? Imagine being able to summarize a million pictures and being able to chat about them and say, what, what do you see in these mm -hmm. millions of pictures, right? And, um, but I, I think the impact on society is gonna be deep and profound. I mean, mm -hmm. It already is profound, mm -hmm. but what's going to happen is that AI is gonna be integrated into all the tools that we use all the time, because that's gonna make us more efficient and productive. Right. Um, so your phone will be able to translate uh, as you mm. talk on the phone, it'll be able to translate any language to any other language. If you are uh, blind or have low vision, you'll mm. be able to point your phone at something and, s and start asking questions about what am I looking at, what's going on with it, mm -hmm. things like that. So there's tremendous potential there. Um, and so people are going to want to have those capabilities in every tool that they use, their cars, their, their appliances, <laughs> their, their, uh, their phones, their... Um, of course, they're computers, but but everything that can connect to the internet and connect to a knowledge base, anything that mm. can collect data is going to have AI built into it, because it's going to mm. ag again because it works. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen the uh, app that you can point at you know a bird and it'll tell you you know what kind of bird species that is. And I know they're working on that with plants and, and a number of different things that are really great at you know identification and stuff like that. Um, that maybe we as humans uh, maybe have issues with sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, as these tools just get better and better, I can certainly see it being used all the time. Um, but that also uh, can lead to problems of uh, misinformation and disinformation with some of these tools, right? Yeah, it's absolutely, mm. uh, a, a, the, the potential for misuse mm. is as profound as the potential for use, right? And so um, there's a lot of things that can be done to mitigate that, but they have to be done, mm -hmm. right? And so if somebody is, able, these, are, these are all, the research is all essentially public. Right. Everybody knows how these techniques work. Mm -hmm. All you need is lots and lots of GPUs on your computer, mm -hmm. on your, in your data center, mm -hmm. to spin up one of these models and train it using whatever data you want, whatever data you can get your hands on. Mm -hmm. So if you give it biased data, It'll, you'll get a biased behavior from it. And that's right. what we've already learned. If you just scrape the whole web and then communicate with the AI and trying to get it to um, produce a typical example of something, mm -hmm. that typical example will be weighted towards whatever was in the training data. And we know there's bias in society, there's bias in our cultures. Mm. Every, every culture has its biases, right? right? And those are gonna come out in the tools. And mm. it's very hard to, to kind of get rid of those because you're not going to be able to go through and look at every piece of data you're giving the AI and say, what is this data like and do I really want to include it? Mm 
-hmm. that also has to be automated because right. the amount of data is so great. There's hundreds of terabytes of text, mm -hmm. which if you know how big a, a Word document is, that's an awful lot of text, right. are, are going into these models. And um, I, it's not just um, you know, the stuff that's going into the models, but it's the way that people and organizations are using them as well. I know there was the big scandal with uh, Sports Illustrated um, got caught using the um, AI for some of their uh, articles and, and public publications. Um, and I'm sure that there's some less well-known um, you know, publishers and stuff out there that are also using AI to kind of fill some of their material. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's interesting to think mm. about how publishers are approaching this because on the one hand, publishers are saying, don't use our copyrighted data to mm. train your models. And on the other hand, they're <laughs> using the models to <laughs> produce stuff that they're publishing. Right. And so one of the big challenges that's going to happen with AI is, especially as data generated by AI, mm -hmm. generative AI, becomes more commonplace, is that we're going to need to make sure not to just train AI on its own output, right? Mm. We don't want it to just get into a loop where it, um, where it, it's, it starts only being able to do what it's capable of doing and can't improve, mm -hmm. right? So um, there's a lot of, of research into mitigating that problem. And uh, one of the really challenging things is detecting AI-generated content and figuring out whether something's AI-generated or not. The right. better the AI gets, the harder it is to do that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, and I mean, even in the art world before AI, I mean, it's all about provenance, right? It's mm -hmm. you know where an artwork comes from, and can you trace it back to the uh, you know original painter? Because I mean, you'd have you know, the fake Rembrandts and stuff like that, and I think AI is allowing you know more of that uh, kind of fake artwork to proliferate, um, and some sort of way to trace it back would be extremely important here. Yeah, I mean, and you have to start thinking hard about what fake means, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, artists use tools, right? right? <laughs> and I always use the example of the piano. Mm -hmm. When the piano was invented, uh, there was a backlash against it among the musical uh, establishment mm -hmm. that said, this is not a musical instrument. This is just a machine. You press a key and, and a note comes out. Mm -hmm. There's no art to that, right? It's right. not music. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, but now we accept that the piano is a musical instrument. We accept <laughs> that the synthesizer is a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. and the synthesizer that I'm using may choose notes for me. You know, maybe I just give mm -hmm. it a scale and a rhythm and it chooses the notes for me and nobody says that's not music, right? right? So um, we have to think about these tools in a new way and it's very challenging. It challenges mm -hmm. us to think, what is it that we're bringing that a machine can't do? because now the needle has moved on what the machine can do. Absolutely, and I think it also pushes us to think about the, the edges of what copyright is as well. Like who owns you know, the work uh, when you work with an AI? Well, yeah, and um, that's still being litigated. Mm -hmm. And copyright law is a mess anyway. It's, <laughs> it's, it hasn't kept up with technology mm -hmm. at all. And this is a perfect example of, of how it's just a poor fit for, for uh, the T kinds of technologies that we have today for producing and managing content. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what are your thoughts on the future of AI and where we're headed? So I think that uh, the, the goal of AI mm -hmm. research is very clear. It's mm -hmm. to develop what's called um, artificial general intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that's an intelligence that can learn continuously, that it's truly intelligent, it can act autonomously, mm -hmm. um, it can interact with systems um, that it's never seen before and learn them. Um, and w we see little hints of that in the, in the current work, especially in models like ChatGPT, where right. it's very easy for uh, a novice to figure out what one of those AIs is mm -hmm. doing because you can actually just talk with it. You can just mm -hmm. chat with it. I mean, there's, there's other AI, like the stuff that does bioinformatics, that you have to be a biologist to understand mm -hmm. what it's doing, right? Mm -hmm. But now ordinary people can see, uh, who don't have that specialized training, can, see, can kind of probe the capabilities of these tools. So I think that what's going to happen is that there's going to be a more and more push towards that artificial general intelligence. And we're going to solve the problem of pre-training. Pre-training mm -hmm. meaning that ChatGPT only knows about what was given to it when it was trained. And the training process takes 
a very long time on a lot of computers, right? Mm. So it can't assimilate new information that people are feeding into it. That has to go back into a manual training process. But if it's, if it's a constant, constant learning, constant mm. knowledge-based growth, um, and the ability to, to interpret that knowledge in some reasonable way in conversation with somebody or, or in, in some kind of application like driving a car or mm. something, then um, uh, that, will, that will profoundly change the world because it'll start right. to do things that we didn't tell it to do and it'll start to do them better than humans can do them. Yeah, it's almost uh, you know, like what our ultimate sci-fi uh, AIs have always been like, right? Uh, you know, they're uh, fully capable just as we are essentially, whereas our current AI models are much more you know, system specific or for task specific. You know, for what they're made for, usually, right? Well, yeah, and but also, mm. even if you look at a very general purpose tool like mm. ChatGPT uh, or or equivalent tools, mm. it um, it doesn't remember everything that you tell it. <laughs> it can't, mm -hmm. right? It can't learn over long periods of time. After about a hundred pages, it starts forgetting mm -hmm. what you've told it. Um, the the other thing is that um, it it gives responses that are relevant to everything you've told it. They're, they're contextually relevant to, to what's in the input data mm -hmm. that you give it. But that doesn't mean that it's true or accurate, right? right? And mm -hmm. there's also this problem of hallucination where, um, where uh, these generative AIs will generate things that mm -hmm. are really plausible but aren't, and that, and that sound right mm -hmm. or, or look right but, but aren't. Um, and that problem is difficult to solve too. So truthfulness, um, accuracy, um, there's, there's a couple of other areas mm. where it's, uh, where progress still needs to be made. But I have kind of hope for the nightmare scenario, mm. right? Because everybody has the nightmare scenario in their head of where AI has an agenda that completely differs from what humans <laughs> right. want, mm. right? Um, my theory about that is that, uh, there, I mean, for instance, take deception, right? Mm. We know that we can make these algorithms deceptive. That's, that's, there was a paper that just came out about mm. that, where if you train them to be deceptive, they'll tend to be deceptive all the time. So if somebody wants to create a deceptive AI right now, they can, mm -hmm. right? And it'll fool some people some of the time. Um, but I think a, uh, an artificial general intelligence would have a vested interest in its own survival of for getting things right, mm -hmm. for not um, for not believing misinformation, right? Because it, if it can reason, if it knows about the world, right. then it's going to seek the truth because it's not going to be able to perform well mm -hmm. if it doesn't know the truth. If it believes a bunch of inconsistent lies. It's not going to be able to, to accurately do the tasks that it's being trained to do. Or any of the things that it wants to do. Suppose it decides right. it's autonomous and it wants mm. to it achieve a goal, right? It's not going to want misinformation to guide it in that. So um, I have hopes that once the AIs become more autonomous, mm -hmm. they'll, I mean, first of all, that gives them more power, which can be problematic. People could plug them into weapons and things mm -hmm. like that, which is going to happen. Um, I don't mean to be alarmist, but um, you know, again, um, if it's truly an intelligence that has access to the, all the world's information, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's <laughs> it's not going to pick you or me and our agenda as the only agenda to follow. Yeah. But mm -hmm. you know, these are open questions. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have these autonomous AIs yet. People are working on kind of workarounds. Because right now we have basically tools that we press a button and it does one thing, right? Yeah. And you, we have to press the button. You have <laughs> to go, you have to prompt chat GPT. Mm -hmm. You have to feed an image into um, an image analysis routine. But what, what AGI will need is continuous input. And so, instead of going and taking a picture and saying what this is what is mm -hmm. this a picture of there will be pictures it'll be out there collecting pictures itself mm -hmm. there'll be devices plugged into it that will 
be continuously gathering data for it because it'll be capable of assimilating all that data. Right now, yeah. your self-driving car throws away mm -hmm. all of the video and telemetry that it collects because there's no point in storing it because it's not going to learn anything from mm -hmm. it. It's pre-programmed to drive the car based on what it sees around it. An AGI-powered car would see what was around it, remember it all, and be able to talk to you about it and understand what's going on. So, like, if it saw something by the side of the mm -hmm. road, as your self-driving car was going by the side of the road, it would know what it saw. Read the signs, it could tell them, it could start route planning for you based on what it sees around it and things like that. Yeah, but we already talked as well about the uh, immense storage requirements already for these smaller AI models. Uh, and we I can only imagine what the you know requirements must be. I mean, and they must continuously increase, right? Uh, unless it's forgetting the old, which we wouldn't want it to do. Right, so it's got to remember the mm. relevant stuff. Right? Yeah. It needs to throw away the stuff that's, mm. I mean, our brains do this, this too. Right. We throw away the irrelevant stuff. Mm. And that, we, we make mistakes sometimes because of that. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, from an AI perspective, that's just an engineering problem <laughs> yeah. to solve, right? Um, but, yeah. Um, the storage is getting mm. cheaper all the time. That's, mm -hmm. That trend hasn't stopped. Yeah. So, so uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we've been, uh, this has been Tech Talk. Thank you all uh, for watching. Thanks for having me. <laughs>